My name is Henry Bourne. For more than 40 years, I taught graduate students and postdocs in a biomedical laboratory and had a wonderful time doing that. Today, I'm going to talk to you about graduate education and the fact that it needs to be changed. And I'm going to tell you that we, meaning the PIs and the students, have to change it because the NIH will not be able to and won't. And I'm going to also suggest that we do this first in a set of small experiments that are very local in a few high quality new graduate programs formed for this experimental purpose with really high quality professors and high quality students. And the premise will be that if they succeed in making better graduate programs, just a few of them, others will follow. So now, why do we need to do anything at all? What's wrong with PhD education in biomedical science? In fact, it's been a huge success for six or seven decades. Uh, it's produced wonderful scientists. The graduate students have, during their graduate school, produced wonderful science themselves. Many of them have gone on to great careers. So what's wrong? The problem is really not so much the graduate programs themselves as that the world has changed and changed in a major way that needs to be dealt with. And if it's not dealt with, it will cause disaster. The first and the biggest and worst change is the dreadful feedback loop that you've read about or heard about from Michael Teitelbaum in these lectures, in this series of lectures, and from Bruce Alberts and his colleagues on the printed pages of PNAS, and from many others. And that feedback loop works like this. There's huge competition nowadays among PIs and institutions to get papers published and to get more dollars from NIH and other and private uh, donors. And that means more labs and bigger labs. It means more graduate students in each lab and more postdocs. And it does produce more papers per lab in better journals. And that ratchets up the competition still further. Now, there's a thing it doesn't do, and that is it doesn't produce more research jobs, except for graduate students to be graduate students and postdocs to be postdocs. And that's not the purpose of research. The purpose of training students is to allow them to become researchers, not to allow them to fill laboratories and do the work. So there's a second problem associated with this, and that is the context in which the problem has occurred. The feedback loop cannot be fixed without big changes in the actual texture of graduate education, the substance of it. And we can't make those changes without changing laboratories. We have to deal with the issue of getting the work done without having zillions of graduate students and postdocs all the time to do all of that work. And so it's a critical problem, and the experiments are the best way that I'm going to describe are the best way to deal with it. All of those experiments should deal with yet another problem, and that is the huge length of time, six and a half years on average, that it takes to get a biomedical PhD. That length of time is closely intertwined with the conflict of interest that PIs find themselves in. On the one hand, they want to teach students how to do science, but on the other, they need to get the work done. And those two are not strictly compatible with one another unless students stay in the lab a long time. So exploitation, yeah, that's a problem. 
uh, we do need to spend more time thinking about actual teaching. But it's not just evil exploiters. Uh, it really is the fact that the mentor-student relationship is so satisfying that many PIs and many, many students get enormous satisfaction from it and want to keep it going. And that's the real underlying human problem we have to deal with. Now, on top of that, what's happened is that the competition uh, derby has put the squeeze on both students and PIs because they both are now convinced that a blockbuster paper in Cell, Nature, and Science is necessary for a PhD to succeed in life and necessary for a postdoc as well, another such paper. And what we do is we tell ourselves, well, students are very young, and so they should have long PhDs in order to grow up. But that is balderdash. And the reason is that those long PhDs and longer postdocs sometimes produce people who are ready to run a laboratory when they're 40 years old, after the most creative and energetic years of their lives, which they have spent working for somebody else. That's not a good idea. So I've said that the NIH can't and won't fix these human problems. The reason is that the NIH, it will be opposed by many PIs, by institutions, and it'll find itself in a fix if it tries to do something. This is a problem that humans need to deal with because it's a human problem. And the first thing is not to do what NIH and many PIs are doing right now, which is to paint the problem over with lipstick and makeup and to pretend that a lab PhD is a glitzy thing that opens vast gateways to huge numbers of jobs not just to be a professor, but to be almost anything. Well, it was wrong, and it is wrong for us to continue to push students uh, to qualify for non-existent academic jobs. But it's equally crazy to pretend that those other jobs will magically appear. We don't see a huge clamor for entrepreneur venture capitalists, for science writers, for editors in journals, for policy mavens who deal with the minutia of science and uh, its funding. What we're doing is pretending that those exist in order to allow us to continue fooling ourselves with dreams of blockbuster, blockbuster papers and unlimited future NIH dollars to pay for these uh, dreams. Now, to deal with these, we need to set up carefully designed experiments at a human scale. That means a small number of very local, first-rate PhD programs created for this experimental purpose that have top quality professors, students, and environments. And those programs should share certain goals, although they can achieve them in lots of different ways. The first goal is that they must first teach students how to do research. That's their primary goal. Or allow students actively to learn how to do research is another way to put it. They should also shorten the time to degree to somewhere between four and five years. And they should also work to defuse the major context issue, which is uh, the equation of laboratory workers with students, uh, and the fact that we need to have somebody to actually do the work in laboratories. Now, by the way, if this works, we might be able to damp that dread feedback loop, but these programs by themselves won't do that. Now, the experiments uh, will not be lockstep identical, but they will share certain qualities. One is they will have to define the purpose of training and then design their programs to achieve that purpose. And the purpose is that students learn how to do science. But they, to do that, they need to do three things, and only three things. 
The first one is to be able to identify really good questions. The second is to design and perform really good experiments that shed light on those questions. And the third is then, after the exp those early experiments are done, to decide which ones to follow up and which ones can be put aside for later. Now, those are not easy lessons to learn. Let's recognize it. But teaching them and learning them will require big changes. The first one is that we need to stop pretending that blockbuster papers are evidence that these lessons have been learned, because they're not. Now, other necessary changes to make this happen will be these programs will have to attract top candidates. And those candidates should all have had experience in real laboratories so they know what a lab is like before they come. They should know what is ahead of them. And when they arrive, their courses should be short, sweet, and a little hard, sort of boot camp, but not lectures. And they shouldn't last for longer than three or four months, tops. Second, every student who comes in should have a mandatory uh, master's degree exam at 18 months. And at that point, the decision should be made by the student and the faculty whether that student should go on to finish this particular PhD program or whether they would be better suited to take another task on that is, involves knowing about research but not necessarily doing it. Uh, if so, then they should be helped to find that route and to do that. Now, they should also, if they do complete the PhD, they should complete it between four and five years. Now, what do we do about the blockbuster problem? Do we decide, no, they don't need to publish any paper at all? No. They should publish a paper that has new knowledge in it. But they need not publish something that's going to knock the socks off of everybody in the field. Uh, if the work, now we need to deal with what happens if they do. Supposing a student makes a discovery with real blockbuster potential, do we get rid of that student and let the next student get the credit for that work? No. Because if we have uh, staff scientists in our labs, they can continue that work, do the last set of experiments necessary to get the work published, and let the student go on with her life, but still be the first author on the paper. Now, is this all a pipe dream? No, it's not. The reason is that one place, that is the Watson School at Cold Spring Harbor, has solved the time to degree problem for 15 years worth of graduate student admissions. The average time to degree there is less than five years. And the careers that these first highly qualified students go on to are excellent. They're almost all in research, sometimes in academia, often in uh, uh, biotech or ph uh, uh, big pharma, uh, and sometimes in government but they are satisfying careers that do exactly what the students learned how to do. Now, how did they do that? They did that with short courses. They did that with very strong faculty oversight. And by sticking hard to the, the time to short time to degree as a goal. And they also did it because Cold Spring Harbor itself paid the stipends and tuitions of the students after fellowships and training grants ran out. That meant that a big impetus to the PI's conflict of interest was done away with at a stroke. And that is very important. So we mustn't ignore that context. Enlightened institutions will have to help with these experiments. They will have to pay the stipends and tuition of a few students in the program uh, as, as we described for Cold Spring Harbor. It won't cost a lot because there won't be that many students. Uh, they will also have to give incentives to the PIs who, to hire staff scientists. A staff scientist costs 
maybe twice what it costs for tuition and fees of a graduate student every year that are paid now out of research grants. So economically it can be done and that staff scientists, if they're good, can do just as much work as two graduate students, even if the graduate students are really first rate and at the top of their form. Now, these experiments may work, they may not, but it's very important to realize that if we don't try them, we won't know. Uh, they're not easy to do. It should be said straight out that it's hard work to start a new graduate program. It's hard work to attract the students, to select them, and then to allow them to learn in a new way. PIs will need to buy in at the outset, and the institutions will need to pony up some dollars. But if these experiments are undertaken, we'll already have done something that's very important, which is to rethink how PhD training might be. That is very important. And if two or three or four or five of the different experiments work, other students will flock to those programs and other programs will emulate their innovations. NIH will start the flow of dollars towards those programs and scientists will be made faster and at much lower cost. So it's crucial to realize that if we don't undertake these experiments and if they don't work, the dollar costs of graduate training and the pipeline overload that uh, uh, we create will cause severe damage not only to graduate education but to biomedical research itself. And I leave you with this uh, notion. After all, the experiments that I propose are much more likely to work than anything else we have before us. They're certainly more likely to work than waiting for the NIH to do something on its own because the NIH is not capable of doing this kind of human experiment in a thoughtful and effective way. It's capable of adopting it if it works, but not of making it happen. Uh, thank you.